All right, we're going to be getting started. All right, everybody. So I hope you listen to me and are sitting somewhere different where there's different people. Ideally, you are doing that. Um, it's hard to meet new people. I understand that. I'm, that's why I'm so happy that I get to stay up here all day and let you talk, and I, I don't necessarily have to have conversation. I w that came out really badly. I would love to talk with all of you. I'm just I'm, I'm introverted, so it's a it takes a lot of energy to do that. Um, all right, because I put that. There we go. All right. So once again, my name's Mike. I'm one of the organizers, but I wanted to thank the other organizers who made this day possible, the Drupal Association organizers as well, but the team I work with, Megan, Beth, and Tyler. So let's give them a round of applause. They deserve it. Uh, as well as our sponsors, again, Acquia Accelerant and Media Current. They sponsored specifically uh, the Higher Ed Summit, so we thank them for allowing us to have this day and do that. Next week, we can clap for them too, yeah? Uh, so our afternoon agenda, uh, it's a lot like the morning. Uh, we're gonna have two more lightning talks, another sponsor talk, we'll have a small break, and then we're gonna do rounds of, of boffs uh, where we're gonna have certain tables focus on certain topics, and then you're gonna have to move around to talk about certain topics. Uh, and I have a goal for everybody here, or a challenge, right? In the next week, I challenge you to follow up with someone you've talked with today and work towards maintaining an active connection, right? We're all in related to higher ed in Drupal. We all have knowledge to share, so I think you have a lot of great conversations at DrupalCon, but even better if you can carry it forward. So make that a goal. Reach out to someone, uh, connect with somebody you've talked with today, and, and build that network. I've talked to a lot of people this week from the higher ed world, and um, I love connecting with them. Even though earlier I said I'm glad I don't have to talk with people. <laughs> Uh, all right, um, all right. I told you to do that. All right. So next, we're gonna have a lightning talk by Adrian about how to design under the constraints and bureaucracy of higher education. Hello, how was lunch? How's the energy? Can you hear me in the back? Okay, amazing. Hi, I'm really excited to be here. It's only my second DrupalCon, so I'm uh, just overwhelmed by, um, first and foremost, it's the people, it's the community. So many amazing uh, conversations, and uh, yeah, I was really excited to be able to uh, continue it with you. So talking about how to design under the constraints, and the bureaucracy of higher education. Uh, so what's that? A little louder. I'm gonna try so hard, but just like wave your arm and I'll, I'll get you. <laughs> so first, a little bit about me. Um, Adrian Smith, I'm a digital strategist and I've been working with the agency Evolving Web, if you uh, saw us out there. But uh, really in my heart of hearts, uh, even if I'm helping uh, my clients sort of understand what are we trying to do, for whom, what are the needs and why, I'm really a librarian, so what I really like to do is just tell people to be quiet. <laughs> 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 but aside from that, I know uh, opinions, uh, bureaucracy, constraints, all of these sort of words, these are the environments we're dealing with, complexity, and uh, added to that, a lot of pressure to probably uh, go fast. We have academic schedules to respect. Everyone has a million other things to do. So when we're talking about website rebuilds, website redesigns, how can we really get it right knowing uh, that, yeah, these are the sort of um, uh, the obstacles we have to deal with. So uh, when I'm working with clients, I'm really intervening a lot in discovery. While I do user research, I do a bit of user experience discovery work, I really see my role as to become like a super partner to project managers, both on the client side and uh, within the agency, and uh, really focused on success. 
So my talk today uh, really is how can we make bureauc bureaucracy in higher ed work for us or at least not actively against us. So all that to say is the takeaways I have today in this lightning talk are really going to be usable for anyone. You don't have to be in an agency. You don't have to be uh, sort of working on a project right now. But uh, I wanted to make sure that, again, it was going to be applicable because these are the things that are not going to be necessarily technical, but they'll make our technical choices go easier. They're not really necessarily going to be designed, but they're going to help us get consensus, or at least uh, if I don't uh, want to uh, go along with it, I will accept the decision and not actively work against it. So uh, just to keep in mind as we're sort of uh, framing the conversation. So essentially, ignore them at your own risk. And uh, what I love to do, uh, because of uh, my background in uh, library information studies and knowledge management, I like to share failures. I don't even say lessons learned, because that's a fancy way of saying. Uh, we failed, we messed up, it didn't go well. How are we going to do better next time? Because I know higher ed isn't that kind of the point, too. So uh, without further ado, the first one is what I call armchair psychology. Do you ever feel like when you're going to work, maybe it's a Monday and uh, you have that colleague who you're sort of their, uh, <laughs> their mental health friend, you can just sort of vent, you get it out. Uh, work is hard, life is hard, there's a lot of stuff. But uh, really, uh, what we found in doing discovery work is that, frankly, it's often even better to start with what's called pre-discovery. So I sort of frame it as uh, saying to the client, what's keeping you up at night? What are you afraid of? Uh, what is your boss hoping to get from this? And uh, the one example I wanted to share was a client who, every time we presented uh, the results of a questionnaire, the results of a mapping workshop, they were constantly poking holes in our data. That's not how it is. I don't think this is going to be right. This is going to work. And at a certain point, we had to sort of look at our working relationship in the project and say, are we on the same team here? Because I felt like uh, you know every step forward, it was three or four or five steps backward. And I just felt like we were at a log jam. Even though we were doing the work, we were delivering the things on schedule. So really able to take a sort of a step back, step into my arms there, psychologist role, and sort of say, uh, what's going on with you? Uh, what's your boss asking you for? Essentially, how can we help you make good, uh, ask what some of these concerns, or uh, really uh, put our finger on what wasn't working? What came out of that sort of difficult conversation, but I'm really happy that we were able to broker it, was that the senior vice president was obsessed with data. If there wasn't data, they wouldn't even listen to it. It was just, uh, yeah, not going to be accepted. So every time uh, we sort of presented results of a more qualitative questionnaire, a mapping workshop where we're sort of working with smaller groups, but again, the insights are far from completely representative. So in this case, it was having a more and a more reliable data that uh, in the eyes of this project sponsor said, okay, I'm never gonna get to the next milestone if I don't uh, really uh, back up our findings, why we take this strategy or these recommendations uh, with the data. So that was really sort of the aha moment. And we said, great, we can help you with that. And we really uh, worked uh, hand in hand with the client to do uh, that sort of uh, uh, additional discovery work that at the end uh, made it so what we finally came to that famous uh, presentation with this guy. <laughs> I think everyone was super quiet on both sides and we're all waiting for the, the famous question. What is he gonna ask? And to our, I don't know, surprise, horror, a mix of both, the question never even came. <laughs> and so we were sort of thinking, wow, that was a lot of investment. But uh, at the end of it, uh, it was also not just a turning point for that deliverable, but in the life cycle of the project overall. We had really established that sort of a foundational trust that uh, took us from being a bit more, not enemies, but a bit working against each other, uh, having a lot of conflict, to just uh, really being able to say, hey, this is what I need. This is what's going on for here. Uh, what are we going to do to address it? So it was really, um, again, a useful lesson. And uh, after learning it more or less the hard way with one client, I had a great opportunity to do it the right way from the beginning with a second client who came to us saying, look, our website is a mess. We whipped it together during COVID. It really reflects uh, the organizational flux we're in. Departments are merging. Some people are unhappy about these changes. Uh, it was a site where I had never seen so many first level navigation items. And so I said, great, that makes a lot more sense now to me. But uh, what this actually helped us do was really formalize it. We had our RACI, but then we sort of had the, uh, like, I don't it was the VIP RACI, in which uh, our client very helpfully said, this person is really loud. This person likes to think their opinion will count more, but maybe it shouldn't. 
this person is worried about this. So just going into those engagements, knowing a bit more about the sort of what's making someone tick, it's always trying to understand uh, what's going to be behind a certain piece of feedback, and it can really help us better prioritize, and then also work to address, because at the end of the day, you want to build, again, consensus. We're going in the same way, so it doesn't uh, serve anyone to have that bureaucracy dragging you down. Uh, the next one I like to call holding up the mirror. So how many of you here sort of use uh, user-centered approaches, user-centered design, human-centered design? It's something that's important to us and we know who our users are? Okay. So for this, I think it's very uh, commendable that we put humans at the center of the experience. We have great user experience researchers and departments and disciplines. We run a lot of focus groups. We involve uh, actual representatives. And I think it applies equally to those who are using our sites on the back end. So if I'm a content editor, uh, what's the experience like for me? But uh, unfortunately, it's easier said than done to really check your assumptions at the door. And uh, with one client, we were sort of uh, getting really divergent opinions when we were surveying internal stakeholders versus actual end users of the experience. And for us, again, we wanted to really represent where are users getting tripped up? They're not uh, converting. They're not clicking on the find the registration CTA here. No one's signing up for the newsletter. So essentially, uh, we were sort of faced with stakeholders internally that just kept saying, but we know about that. We know how to fix that. This is what's wrong. This is where the issues are. And uh, essentially, we sort of said, how are we going to get past this uh, log jam? Because we sort of already anticipated that our designs would not really be meeting the needs of these people who sort of already said, I already know the solution. We don't have to do anything more. So uh, our approach in this case was really to try to see if we could have them get it from the horse's mouth. And uh, by this, I mean uh, involving stakeholders in a uh, user-focused workshop, but saying, uh, you're on mute. You're observing here. You're not allowed to say anything. We really wanted actual students, both prospective and current, to uh, talk about their experience and to make sure that those stakeholders were actively listening, not waiting for their chance to, uh, to rebut, oh, but they didn't go here. It should be like this. And uh, again, I think it was a really useful way for us to just facilitate getting people in the same room like that. And uh, again, once you're sort of uh, really confronted with an actual uh, user, uh, it's, it's easier to ignore a piece of research, much harder to ignore uh, real life students who are telling you exactly what it was. So again, it was a quite a successful technique as well. And last but not least, this is when uh, you've tried the others and sometimes you have to bring out uh, the big guns, but uh, playing the devil's advocate. Um, and with the caveat that no one to hold them, no one to fold them, some things you're gonna have to compromise with and we're not gonna win every battle. So in this case, we had a pretty delicate issue in the case of a, a higher education institution that was really committed to uh, highlighting their commitment to eradicating uh, indigenous uh, racism. So in Canada, obviously, uh, with the First Nations, uh, uh, many indigenous populations, it's really important for us to be committed to the truth and reconciliation process. And it goes beyond just a land acknowledgement on our website. It's really, again, how are we walking the talk? And in the case of this institution, it was amazing. They had really hired uh, dedicated uh, elders who were on site. They had indigenous student services, lots of programs, lots of support. Uh, frankly, it really came out as one of the, the main differentiators and something that was really uh, unique and uh, special for their brand. At the same time, knowing this, the key stakeholders were adamant about giving them really priority placement on the website. So we're talking not just the home page, but in the persistent navigation and really highlighting it everywhere. When we did go back and look at the data, we realized that uh, indigenous students represented less than 1% of the population, whereas international students were at 37%. We combined that with some of our more uh, like boots on the ground research. We had talked to the coordinators, people who had used indigenous student services, and what kept coming out of those interviews was, uh, we love the services, we love the people, it's a community here. But on the website, we just feel like it's segregated. We're shunted over here, and we sort of have our own path. We're not linked into the rest of the community as it's represented on our public-facing you know, digital front door. And so knowing all of that information and anticipating that whatever new information architecture or site map I was going to present would get shot down if it didn't have indigenous people right front and center, I decided to, again, go a bit uh, uh, with a more muscled approach. And I just sort of said, 
if we do this, are we really being consistent with the message that you're trying to put forward in terms of building one community versus uh, calling out? Are we risking being seen as doing virtue signaling and just sort of, again, slapping on a label there when, uh, quite frankly, there are much um, uh, more interesting ways of articulating what's actually going on with your school? And uh, we worked very closely with a creative team to ensure that, again, more in terms of the look and feel, the design, we're able to really highlight some of those elements that are super important to the institution. But uh, again, just uh, knowing that we are going to come up with that resistance and being able to have a couple of, uh, again, devil's advocate arguments uh, in our pocket uh, helped us just to make sure that, again, at the end of the day, we want to build a product that's going to be used by end users, that's going to serve the goals of the institutions. That's why we're all here. And so, again, it was a, a useful tactic uh, in order to make sure that, again, we're not uh, seeing the forest for the trees and uh, making sure that we're doing things yeah, at the end in a user-centered approach. So uh, that's it for me. Um, I hope it was uh, applicable, a bit relevant, or that you, you saw some of yourselves in there too. And uh, my only plug is we are hosting a couple of uh, community events coming up. So if anyone is interested in coming up to Montreal in June, or New York City in September, we'd love to have you. Uh, it's really important for us to get the community together to hear uh, really people talk about the challenges they're facing, whether it's a Drupal specific, open source, more widely designed UX. Uh, but yeah, feel free to uh, check out the website if you're interested. All right, time for you all now to talk about, about that. Here we go, all right. I'll make it full screen. Hopefully these are uh, as on topic as they can be. I made them big, so go. <laughs> talk about design and UX constraints in higher ed.
All right, we're going to start winding down those conversations. We're going to start winding down those conversations. I like it when you have me say it twice, because now I get to tell you a joke. And this one has a, a UX and a library twist to it. So yeah, it's actually pretty good. Let's see, where is it? Um, Hey, what do you call a UX update on a Drupal website in higher education? Fantasy fiction. Be <laughs> because everyone has a version they imagine, but no one has seen it in reality. That one's not too bad. That's pretty good. OK, um, so next up, um, unfortunately, our, our last Lightning Talk speaker was unable to make it to DrupalCon. Uh, so instead, you're going to have me give you a Lightning Talk. Woo! Because uh, I had one on a similar subject. Oh, all right. So, uh, <laughs> it's mine. It's mine. Yeah, it's just, yeah, I'm just going to, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to read you <laughs> chat GPT jokes. <laughs> yeah, what could go wrong? Um, but I will say, so I, like I said before, I like to run a tight ship. So, this is for all of you. Now you get to pull me off stage if I run over. So, I get 15 minutes. And that means I will be done at, what's the time? What's it? Uh, I'm scheduled to go to two. All right. So you can let me know if I'm about to go over and just raise your hand. Um, hopefully I can do it in time. And that's the wrong deck. Here we go. Like I get to skip all the, hi, this is me. This is where I work stuff because I've been talking to you all day. But hi, I'm Mike Miles. I work at MIT Sloan as the director of web development. Um, my team and I manage the school's websites. Uh, and today I want to talk to you in a lightning talk format of, I'm going to set my timer too. Cool. Of uh, unlocking your team's capabilities with AI for web development and higher ed. So I do have these slides available at this bit.ly link, which I also have at the end. Uh, it'll be, uh, I'll get it to you later on as well. And um, all the artwork you see in here in this presentation, I did use an AI tool to make the artwork. So I, that's all. Um, I have the credits there. So you can actually go and see what prompts I used and what model I used. So uh, let's talk about generative AI for web development in general. I think AI, and we've probably all, obviously I know all of us have heard about it all this week uh, in other places. But it's great for web development because code is full of patterns. And these AI models, what they do is they consume and figure out patterns. And that's how they produce output, right? Is they, you give them a prompt, and they use all the information in their training to figure out the pattern to best continue and answer that prompt. All the tools we use, Drupal, Symfony, CSS, all the frameworks and languages we use, they're all pattern-based. And they all have patterns to them that have all been consumed because it's open source, right? So it's all on the web. So there's a lot of these models that know all the information about what we're working with, and they know it probably a, a little better than us, though you know, contextually we know it better. So I think using AI as part of your web development process is beneficial in freeing up development time for higher level problem solving. Uh, working with or for higher ed, our role our, in our team's roles are not to know everything about our frameworks. And, and it's not to spend a lot of our time building custom modules or themes. Those are the tools we use to achieve what we're supposed to be doing is helping uh, promote the school's knowledge and information to different audiences, whether that is uh, new students or prospective students or you know business leaders that we want to share our research with, uh, donors, alumni, et cetera. Our role as web development team members is to get that information out there about the school. And uh, all the web tools we use, the languages we use, those are our tools to do that. So we need to spend most of our time really thinking through the high level problem solving of like how do we meet these needs and how do we use the tools to meet these needs instead of spending a lot of our time of like, how do I write a service plugin again? Like I forget how to do that. But I mean, maybe you should know how to do that. But there's a big market of developer specific AI tools, a lot of open source ones as well, that you can use to help your team uh, gain some efficiencies to, and spend more time thinking on these higher level problems. 
So I like to think of AI as it's coming along to be a teammate, not a replacement for the people on our teams. Don't look at the hands in this picture. <laughs> AI has, that's, that's what, like, there was that thing in the keynote about, like, can you pick out which one is AI generated? Look at the hands. Um, AI is a teammate. They're going to be your most knowledgeable but least informed member, right? As I said, it can consume all the patterns, known patterns, and, and how to write code, uh, but it's not going to know anything about the context of what you're trying to achieve. Stakeholders don't even know what they want to achieve when they tell you what they want. <laughs> so for an AI, like, and, uh, and I, Try to tell people like, yes, an AI is going to give you exactly what you ask for. But as we know, working in development, what people ask for is not what people want. So it's going to know how to build the things. It's not going to know why you want that. So that's where it's a teammate. It can build off that process. Again, it allows the team to focus on solving the project needs and not the nitty gritty, um, repeatable, basic coding implements that you need to do. And higher web, web teams are usually small. We pretty run pretty lean usually. Uh, and so AI is a perfect tool to take advantage of dev adjacent roles and, and fill those out so your team can really focus on what matters. So some of the roles I see AI playing is a rubber duck. How many heard of, have heard of rubber ducks for development? Right, That's when you're stuck on a problem and instead of working it in your head, you talk it out loud either with another developer or with a rubber duck on your desk or with an AI tool. So I think the benefit of having to explain technical challenges to AI tools like, say, even just ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot or GitHub Copilot, it helps spark new ideas and approaches to problems. Because with these tools, you can ask them, like, hey, I'm stuck on doing, trying to solve this. Give me three options for how to do it. And it can give you ways you wouldn't even think of that you can then explore further. Having to know how to write conversational prompts, right, uh, AI tools that you use prompting for, as I said, it's going to answer your prompt, so you have to ask it the right thing. Being able to articulately explain the technical challenge you're running into to an AI is a really good um, skill to build up when you have to explain technical things to stakeholders or less technical people. Uh, on the other side of that, if you're, say, a project manager, you're a less technical-minded person, if you want to make sure you're explaining things uh, in a more technical way, working with AI and saying, how would I say this in a more technical way could help with that as well. So I think uh, working with AI as a rubber duck helps you get better at explaining your technical needs or challenges. Some tools that I like using for this, find.com, which offers code suggestions and even a pair of programming capabilities, and it's all an online interface and it's free to use. Uh, I think they have a paid tier. And Uizard is an AI tool you can use for rapid web uh, or mobile UI prototyping from prompts or sketches. So this could be like you're having a conversation and you're sketching it out and you can show it uh, to this tool and it'll make a, a UI prototype, which is really cool. Obviously you have to tweak that some. AI can act as a reviewer on your team. It can flag common problems early and suggest improvements if you have it plugged into your IDE process or your CI process. Again, it knows all the rules of your frameworks. So it can, some of these tools that are available can flag those before like a senior developer has to do the code review. So that can catch those faster. It's like using a linter on, on steroids. Uh, it can provide analysis and explain third party legacy systems or documents. So if you've ever worked with third party code or you've inherited a legacy site that's not commented at all and you wanna understand what the very long 200 line function is doing, you could provide that to an AI and ask it to explain it to you. Uh, or if you have obfuscated code, uh, you just have the minified version, you could have that explain it to you. So it can help you solve those problems. You can also use it to analyze complex error logs uh, to offer insights into the root causes a little faster. Like I've done this with uh, like the watchdog log in Drupal where you get the big stack trace. I've fed that into AI and be like, explain to me what this is saying. And it can, it can do it a lot more succinctly and help me track the root problem a lot faster. Codiga is an AI tool that performs static analysis and code reviews. I believe it has a VS Code plugin or a PHP Storm plugin as well. Private GPT, this is an open source tool that can run uh, not LLMs, which are large language models, but LMs, which are just language models locally. Uh, a lot of them are pretty much copies of like the ones you'll see as large language models. So you can run private GPT like on your laptop and feed it files to consume and ask it prompts against those files. I've tried this with, say, our user documentation to pull it down 
and then I can ask it like, oh, tell me what I need to know to write an article, and it can tell me about all the fields that are involved. So using stuff like this, it can help you review like your code base if you fill it, give your whole code base without having to like send your 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 code to a third party system. AI can be a creator. So it can help you create development plans because uh, it can break things out into large from large tasks into smaller parts. So if you are tasked with some huge goal and you don't even know where to start, having a conversation with an AI tool be like, I need to solve X, Y, and Z. I'm using Drupal, I'm using this technology. What's a good plan to do this? So if you don't have a project manager on your team, if you're just like a, a lone IT person, the w one web person, you can kind of use AI as a project manager in this way to help you break out uh, these larger problems uh, into the smaller tasks that then you can further dive into. It can suggest code and generate code documentation. Uh, my team, we've been playing with uh, GitHub Copilot for doing this. So we can prompt Copilot in VS Code, like I need a function that does X, Y, or Z. It can generate that for us. Or we can highlight our code and be like, can you help me write useful code comments for this? And it can do that as well, which saves us time and makes sure our code is well documented so that later on somebody doesn't have to take our code and give it to an AI to have it explain what it's doing because our comments tell it what it's doing. You can also use it to generate realistic data, content, and images for use in lower level environments. So if, say you're dealing with uh, you know, um, student information that's very sensitive that you don't necessarily want on just a developer's laptop. You could use some AI tools to r generate content that is very similar in structure and matches the structure of that student data and populate your data. You could even ask it to write it as a SQL statement and then you can inject that into your lower level environment instead of copying down that private data. GitHub Copilot is a great tool uh, that I've done work with for code generation. Cody.dev is a version that's really good as well. It also has a, a local a version you can run locally. Um, so it's, and I believe it's open source. Uh, so they can analyze and suggest code and generate code documentation. ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot, I think we're familiar with these tools where you can prompt them to create that fake content. Like you can tell ChatGPT, Make, uh, write me a bad joke, or you can say, you know, write me um, a, a database query to fill out um, users. So let's talk a little bit about Drupal and AI. I'm, I'm sure most of you have, have gone to at least one talk this week about Drupal and AI. There's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, to have AI help with Drupal projects, there's already over 150 modules that have AI integrations. To what degree that is, I'm not sure, but you know, this is something that the community obviously is moving on, uh, moving with, and it's something that you can embrace in all your projects. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the Yale Sites team. Are they here? Yeah. Hey, with uh, your chatbot thing, that was a really cool presentation. So I was already like, oh, how can I do something similar? Um, there's the Drupal OpenAI integration module that has a bunch of sub modules like the OpenAI Devel, so to generate that realistic dummy data instead of Lorem Ipsum. Uh, you can reduce the effort on content editors by providing alternative text for images using like the automatic alternative text module, which I believe analyzes the image and generates um, alternative text for the image. So that could save uh, work on your content, edit content editors so they don't have to come up with that, but then you can still be you know, accessibly compliant. Uh, and uh, there's uh, like other tools like the Drupal Droid, which is a ChatGPT agent where it's tuned to be prompted for Drupal-related questions. So you can say like, hey, how do I write a service? And it it's already knows you're talking about Drupal and Drupal 9 or Drupal 10. And it'll do that for you. Plus, there's a lot more things with Drupal that um, you know, I've learned more <laughs> about this week, I'll be honest. Uh, all right. And some considerations when using AI, though, because right, there's a lot of um, gray areas. Models only produce output that look correct. Luckily, when we're talking about it from a coding perspective, it works or it doesn't. But there's, you know, in the keynote, there's talk about how just because it produces something that works doesn't mean you should fully trust it because it may not be secure. Um, also, AI-generated content is not copyrightable in the U at least in the U.S. I think for us working in open source, it's not that big of a deal, or you know, that's not as much of a challenge for the work we do. But if your code base, for whatever reason, is closed source, and then you put AI-generated code in there that's not copyrightable, what does that do to your legal concerns? I have no idea. I'm not a lawyer. So talk to your, <laughs> your lawyers at your campus. 
Uh, and then data you provide to third-party systems could be used for further training. So if you're worried about you know, um, sending up your code to, say, ChatGBT uh, or your documents to ChatGBT and that if you're not paying for it, you're not opted out of it being used for further, further training, just know that that could happen. Uh, so you want to be concerned about that. But there are open source and local versions like LM Studio, Twini, Kodi.dev. These can all be run locally in development environments, and they all have plugins for your IDEs. So it may be a little memory intensive on your laptops, but if you didn't want to send anything to third-party systems, you could run them locally. Uh, so I'd recommend, though, talking to your legal team or um, you know, your IT team, whoever's writing the guidelines. Hopefully, at your institutions, people are writing guidelines for how to use AI uh, on what you can and can't use and what you should think about, about the data you have access to. All right, so my takeaways here. Generative AI, I believe, can free up time for higher level tasks, so you're not spent on the nitty gritty and you can really solve the needs of your, your institute. Discuss with your team which AI tools are best fit for your needs, right? Every team's different. You have different set of skills that you may want to augment, so look to see what's available for that. And then be cautious and verify the output of generative AI, whether that is code completion or bad jokes. Um, <laughs> make sure it works and it does what it says and, 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 and still verify it. Trust but verify. Or don't trust and verify. Um, and then confirm the rules and regulations of your institute on what you can use for tools and what you're allowed to do. If your institute is working on these guidelines, hopefully they are, uh, so that you can make sure you're not going against them and you're not using um, tools that you're not supposed to and submitting your data places you're not. Like at MIT, I know we have uh, an agreement with Microsoft, so we all have access to Microsoft Copilot, which is great, and we know they're not going to train use our data for training it. Uh, and MIT is happy that we use that. That's it. Oh, 21 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> and I'll just say I have some further slides that have like all the prompts I use for generating my images, some further reading, and links to all like the tools I mentioned um, when you get there. Now I'll put back on my MC hat, and I have some questions for you all. Cool. All right, so let's talk about AI, if you're not sick of doing it already. <laughs> and go.
All right, we're going to start winding down those conversations. All right, we're going to start winding down those conversations. Yeah, yeah, all right, you ready for it? <laughs> All right, and um, now uh, I'll, I'll make my apology after I read the joke. <laughs> um, what do you get when you cross Drupal with AI in higher education? A chatbot that's always in beta. I promise that's not a dig at the Yale Sites team. ChatGPT came up with that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's pretty good. All right, uh, next up we're going to have uh, a sponsor talk from Media Current about Harvard College. Don't call it a redesign. Uh, so Kevin and Elliot, come on up. I always like the uh, lounge act, Mike. <laughs> Just step out in front. Last time I presented at DrupalCon last year in Pittsburgh, um, the mic was stuck, and I was doing the whole presentation leaning over to change my slides. It was not great, so hopefully this time will be better. I think you're good to go. So okay, that. cool. Quick um, and easy. Yeah. <laughs> so. We did this as a lightning talk in lightning time two days ago. <laughs> uh, so we're going to speak a little bit slower. Um, and we also changed the title a little bit. But Kevin and I are here from Media Currents to talk about how we believe the redesign is dead. And we're going to share a little bit of a case study that we did, a uh, project that we recently did for Harvard College that we think helps to prove our point. But we'd also love at the end to get uh, some questions and hopefully answer those questions. Um, so I'm Elliot Maurer. I'm the managing director of Media Current. And I'm Kevin Bessarab. I'm our CTO at Media Current. And uh, between the two of us, we've got a lot of different design experience and lots of horrible builds under our belts as well over the years, but also a lot of the iteration and building portions forward and supporting and optimizing and all those different pieces from journalism and products and big physical spaces. <laughs> Yes, we do. Um, so when we were putting this uh, presentation together, we took a look at the RFPs that we've received over the last 24 months, um, some of which, I don't know, there's not, not a real focus on uh, higher ed in this one exactly, a couple <laughs> university centers. But um, we took a look at the RFPs that we received. And as time has gone by, we have seen these RFPs become more and more convoluted. They become longer and longer and longer. We got one just the other day that was 209 pages and that was supposed to be submitted uh, with three USB flash drives that we were just supposed to mail to the government. Um, I don't know how many of you have done that you know, annual like IT training that says if you, get a, if you pick up a flash drive on the ground, don't plug it into your computer. Um, the government does that. <laughs> so it's, it's truly bizarre. But what we're seeing in these RFPs is that they're, they're pages and pages and pages of requirements with no context. We do not know where these requirements are coming from. Uh, when we have folks who are, are moving still in the world of Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, it's here's everything that my Drupal 7 site does that I would like a new site to do in the future. And this site was, oh, by the way, designed 10 years ago. So we took a look at these. We're seeing an average page count of 87, which is still ridiculous. Um, and we're getting less and less context and more and more requirements. And nobody wants to tell us the budget, ever. <laughs> like, 
You know what it is. You all are ex aren't, ex aren't excluded from that either. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as bad. <laughs> we would love to know just a general, you know, rough order of magnitude because it puts us in a position of having to put a number out there and be wrong most of the time in a direction that is either beneficial to you and horrible for us or great for us but means we don't actually win the project. Um, I pulled some Q&A responses from some of those RFPs, and as you see, um, a lot of them ask us to submit a complete budget, a uh, level of detail that is, in my mind, ridiculous, with no information. So provide every line item uh, uh, thing that we've asked for um, down to the cent, and we will provide you no additional information. And if you're wrong, you'll never hear from us again. <laughs> So that when we, we move forward in those projects, we have to put together these timelines that often look like this, uh, where they're very waterfall, they're very long. In my opinion, um, you know, oftentimes we're looking at, I don't think a website should take longer than six months, but we're looking at, at timelines that are generally 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. And that's ridiculous because we know that even the conversation that you all were just having about AI, we know that 12 months ago, we would have had a completely different conversation. So what is the conversation that we're going to be having 12 months from now? And are we building the right thing? We start these projects off, and even when we do a discovery phase, or as we call them, the define phase, we think we know, and you think you know, but in reality, we have no idea. And it's, with even going back to the budget and the timelines and all these different pieces, like you, think you brought up earlier, we say, we, we don't want to give you the range. We don't want to look at that. But in reality, it helps everyone be on the same page of what it looks like. Because now you're comparing apples to apples of what actually are you getting for the budget range and what are those value pieces? Because I don't know how many of you, I'm assuming most here have done RFPs and have actually either submitted to them or been a part of having to manage them. And often what you list in there is just the kitchen sink and you know you're not going to get everything. So how do we start to pull these things together and actually prioritize and think about things in a way that makes sense for the long term of the project and actually more in what we always talk about of an agile way versus really a waterfall direction. And a lot of those different things that were seen in those RFPs make me think often as like just a developer nerd in the past, but also just food and TV and consumption. How many people have known like Alton Brown and his hatred for single use kitchen gadgets and how many things those are? We're both in the New York City area. There's not much space in our places and rooms, and you have to be really specific about what you're actually using, what you're actually putting into your house, or when you're having to move, how you move all that stuff over. And if you've done a Drupal 7, the Drupal 10, or any type of migration process, you realize that all these single-use fields, these single-use content types, these single-use features eat up a ton of your budget and a ton of your time and energy to actually implement along the way versus looking at what can we do to keep iterating this forward and drive things um, in a good direction. Most of these may not actually have a real use case in your site. You do it because 10 years ago we did it and now we have to keep doing it and it's just passed down and passed down and passed down along the way. Most of these features or a lot of these features and hopefully this isn't a quote from one of you, but, um, but were prioritized or made specifically because of internal politics. And we all know in higher education, navigation structures, is that speaking to our audience or is that speaking to ourselves? Our searches, are we looking for just that faculty member that needs to find the way that they, the one report they have that no one else searches for, but they, they run it that way, and this needs to come up in our search results? How do we look at all these different things, and how do we speak to who's using our sites and the different audiences that are coming into those situations? So it leads us into the spot of prioritization. It leads us into this conversation of once we win an RFP, or once you're working in the results of an RFP, or any build in general if you didn't RFP it, how do we prioritize throughout time? How do we think about which feature is more important, feature A or feature B? And how do we talk about that internally? But then also, how do we know that we need both of these all the time? Like there's some reason typically there and there's a reason that it became a requirement. So we always know that there's always something more important and there's always something else out there. And once we continue iterating forward, no matter how good we did a requirements, as soon as we launch, that site is old and it needs to grow and change again. And you're gonna uncover new features that you didn't think about that now that you're live and in the, in the space are gonna actually start having to leverage and implement. So oftentimes that looks a, a little bit like this. Um, <laughs> our users, both our end users, but also 
the, the folks who are using the content management system, they want something that's super simple. They want something that has wide utility that provides them a lot of value and instead we give them everything and it doesn't work. Or it's things that we thought were gonna be useful but we never touched. So how do we get to a place where we're actually building something that is simple, broadly useful and allows us room to expand? Maybe we get to the crazy pocket knife on the right, but we start out with the one on the left, which is the superior product. Even when you're doing that and you get to that, if you build this crazy pocket knife, you often don't realize you're doing it in yeah. the moment until later on. And I think Mandy was bringing this up earlier as we're talking about like the training and documentation pieces is how do you make something that is self-training also? And you, it's just makes sense out of the box and you're starting to understand how to use it. When you grab a Swiss Army knife like this, you know pretty much what to use on a base level. When you get into the right side, what are you doing? What is this? And we don't realize at times until we look back that that feature we really wanted or really needed is actually the thing that we don't like and end up meaning the thing that we really don't like our website about, but we made that requirement ourselves. And how do we like take that step back and think about what is really needed here? So all of these things give us some really bad math. Uh, we have expanding scope, which has implications on our timeline. That leads folks like us to dangle the horrible phrase of change order. Um, and that just leads to frustration um, for all. So there has to be a better way. Do we really need to blow things up and start over every time we want to work on these projects? And if you are still here and still paying attention, you <laughs> could guess the answer to this is no, we should not and should not be thinking about it. And instead, we should probably be thinking about renovating that house on top of the, quote, good bones. Again, TV show references, which I don't watch TV that often, so I don't know why I threw them all into this presentation. <laughs> um, but on top of the good bones and the solid foundations of that foundational house that we have of, of our websites and our experiences, and we take that large capital budget for an RP, we iterate that and invest it iteratively over time and continue to improve and improve and improve and do these small components, features, developments that are continuing to make our sites better and better and better. What if we actually did Agile? What if instead of a 12 month project that has a big launch, big red button launch at the end of 12 months, we had a set of four smaller launches that were still uh, significant? You might still be skeptical. And now we're gonna transition into the part where we tell you how this works. <laughs> so we just did this project for Harvard College and uh, for those who do not know, Harvard College is the undergraduate admissions arm of Harvard University. They over also oversee financial aid. And they, as is common, got a big donation from an alum to update their print material. Now, I do not understand why it is 2024 and we are still spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on print material and then mailing them to teenagers, but <laughs> I am biased. Um, so they got this big donation to work specifically on the print material. They had a refreshed look and now they had their print material out of sync with their website. So they wanted to find a way to bring that look and feel for the, the new lookbook online. And we wanted a way to work with them to do that. But we didn't have, they didn't have a donor who was standing in the wings saying, hey, I'll give you, you know, another six figures to invest in putting this online. We had to figure out a way to work within their budget to do that um, efficiently and economically and without starting from scratch. Not even with even just the budget constraints and things there, but they like their site. They like the yeah. user experiences. It's been live for three or four years now, I believe, at this point. And it's something that they went through that pain of building the site that all of you have experienced and gone through the launch and the pains and trying to get out of that beta mode and looking into the spot of, okay, we, we're comfortable with how this works. We don't want to rethink and have to prioritize again and go through all that stuff we talked about earlier, but we want to actually leverage and continue building off what we have, but make it in a better way. So we looked at a timeline that basically took us from you know, start to launch in the most maximally uh, efficient, efficient way possible. We didn't want to skip any steps because looking at a new print look and feel, we don't want to just copy and paste that online. We know that print design does not automatically translate to the web, even though for some reason in the higher ed space, y'all are still trying to do that. Um, so we have to look at a way to take something that works in print and we have to bring it to life online. We also really wanted to find a way to express the college's desire to convey a more accessible and inclusive Harvard. They, ha um, you know, folks have probably heard about this, but if you come from a family at a certain income level, you can go to Harvard for free. 
So they wanted to find a way to create a, a digital experience that conveyed that accessibility, conveyed that openness, and kind of turned the volume down on what it means to be Harvard, but still Harvard. It's one of the most recognizable academic brands, if not you know brands in the world. And so we created this concept of it's not business casual, it's Harvard casual. It's Harvard, but it's in a more accessible, casual, friendly kind of mode. And we brought that to life through a series of content components that could live alongside their existing components. So we looked at how we could introduce something new into the set, but it would look like it came from the same house. We were focused on things like how could they tell stories better. We introduced a component to bring TikTok, love TikTok, um, bring TikTok to the website, but bring it in a way that isn't doesn't feel like what I like to call the hello fellow kids way of bringing social media online. We wanted it to feel very natural. These are teenagers who are coming to the site, sometimes by themselves, sometimes with their parents, and we want them to be able to consume the social content that Harvard is creating, which is really great content in a way that feels natural and doesn't feel like we've just copied and pasted it from TikTok and tried to put it in a, a format that doesn't work. We wanted to look at ways that we could express the story of Harvard being more accessible for students. We wanted to think about ways to answer their questions before they're asked. We created this really kind of awesome component that you can kind of see under the TikTok component um, that looks like it's a chatbot, but it's not. It's a new way of kind of using an accordion feature that presents questions and answers in a way that is fun to use, I think, uh, but allows them to, to tell stories in a, in a different manner. They also had done some new uh, photography and videography that they wanted to bring onto the site. And that oftentimes, like beyond the, the UX or UI design, the content, the videography, the photography, that's where the storytelling really lives and that's how it's expressed. And so we wanted to have new components that could bring those new pieces to life online and really make them sing. The photography, we, we have to do that on the website. We have to see that and we're often just given it. We, we're often not in a position where we can actually go out and create it but what all of us can control. And in the remote culture and, and remote areas, I don't know how many of you are working out of your offices on campus or for the agencies, you're all probably remote as well, but how, when was the last time you went on campus and walked around and experienced what campus was like? Gone and taken a campus tour, gone to look at different things of how are you talking about our own, how are we talking about ourselves versus in our insulated uh, spaces go out and experience what are people seeing when they get their first touch to us and how do they experience that and how can we take some of those experiences and bring that to the websites and start showing that to our prospective students and users and that translates over into donors and everyone else along the way too. I've been on more campus tours working at an agency that works on higher ed than I did when I went to college. <laughs> it's fascinating. And even when you have all those great designs and those great things that come together, you still need to make a simple editorial experience for things. Um, our scope here was not to reinvent and make the most beautiful, changing editorial experiences. We wanted to build on top of what was already there. It's a paragraph-based approach. And <laughs> when the client was talking to us about, hey, how are we going to do all this? This looks really great. I love how it looks. Like, How are we actually going to implement this and actually make it work? Well, all these components, except for some of the newer ones that were generated, they were all refreshes of existing things that we were iterating on, adding a field into, or reusing fields in different ways as we're, we're looking at those instead of creating these new single-use fields. We could have went through and taken some of these slideshows and homepage heroes and different pieces and said, all right, here's all the new fields for the new design and go copy and paste all your content in. Instead, we looked at some pre-processing. You add a little technical debt by doing this, but in the end, everyone has technical debt. You're always gonna have something there. It's how you deal with it over time that really makes the difference. And we changed that into just a simple toggle, a simple Boolean of let's add in the 2024 design. We want to switch this over. And now for the editors, instead of having to copy and paste and do everything on the site, just go into the interface, click the button, and now this component is into the new design. Another component on the page can be in the design. And time and time again, you're starting to build this entire new look and feel across the site without having all that pressure and pain of migrations and moving things and all the editorial pieces that come along with it. Now, are there changes that need to happen? Yeah, there's some things that need to happen. There's some new things that come along with it. The FAQs you saw earlier, uh, those need to be adjusted some, and there's some new fields that get added in. But we can add that functionality in, and we're now building on an experience versus creating a brand new experience. Um, new York Times, I come back to all the time from journalism background, that they will never rebuild a site. They will always take a piece, tear it down, and rebuild that little portion of it. 
and tech debt's terrible because of that, but, <laughs> but they're very open about how they do that, and then they test it, A-B test it, and think about things, and what is working, what's not, and how do we continue to grow these things over time, and before you know it, you're into a new uh, whole section of, this, of the site. So we were able to go from this design concept of Harvard Casual into production within 90 days for the first seven components, Something four, like that, five, yeah. seven. Uh, but that's that's not the end of the line. We're continuing to work with them to bring additional components into the system. We're looking at things like now that we've made all of these changes and we're seeing how they settle and how, how new users interact with existing, with some of the new components. We've introduced some new wayfinding components that I meant to put a heat map from Site Improve in here, but we're, we've seen just this you know light up of people actually interacting with the navigation concepts. Um, how can we rethink the global navigation to make it more intuitive and more useful as a separate piece so we can evolve that as the site continues to evolve? Yeah, so for those that started multitasking or do the multitasking, we'll give the uh, TLDL of too long, don't listen. But being curious about what all your clients and your, your teams are looking for, being curious about what can we actually be doing here versus trying to just pigeonhole ourselves into doing all the things just because it's the way of doing it. Um, looking at avoiding single use everything, um, what can this be globally used for? How do we think creatively about our content production and the reuse of things so that we can make bespoke distinct experiences through our sites, but not be in the spot where we've got a thousand different things to learn and different um, flow charts of like if then statements of what shows up where and what you chose this and this other thing happens and all this kind of things we need to train and think about. And then look at the highness of remodeling versus rebuilding and continuing to drive in that direction to actually remodel what you have and make something new. And by doing that, you're now able to get that new site basically every two years without that giant effort, migration, capital expense, things of that nature, every two years and continue iterating and, re and respond to design trends and respond to editorial things and continue making things in a better way that not only that you feel better about, but all your users are seeing things come out consistently their feedback gets in more immediately. In three months or a month or your sprint cycle, their feedback gets back to back into the site and they're able to see what they offered and that coming together for them. That's makes a, a good time. That's all we got. <laughs> um, but yeah, all that, yeah, I'm just rambling at that point. <laughs> but <laughs> that is our that's it. speech. Yeah. So the question becomes, <laughs> Do we have any any questions? We have time for questions. I know this doesn't really work on Drupal 7, so that's the <laughs> that's the one question that probably comes out in the caveat of <laughs> how do I do this then? But we you do could have ideas for that. You could take some ideas and, and make some pieces start moving yeah. forward all the way in the back. <laughs> yeah. So the question is about uh, strategies for avoiding single-use content types, um, and that is a really interesting one. Um, Oddly enough, I've seen a little bit more prevalence in leveraging single-use content types now, strictly from an editorial experience perspective, but reusing the fields and the editorial experiences within those to make it really make sense to an end user and not get ourselves in these weird technical debt situations. And the best use I've seen in those typically is when you literally are only gonna have one, I'm gonna use Drupal lingo here, I apologize, but one node for it instead of a whole multitude of nodes. And you're really focused on the editorial experience and some bespoke piece of it that you're wanting to, to leverage. Um, where I also see it, I mean, the TLDR on that specifically comes down to editorial experience and simplification of it. So what has happened in a component-based world is this landing page content type, that you try to do all things in that one content type for everything else. Whereas sometimes you want to have very core systematic metadata and fields that are reused on all your content types on, all, on that landing page, but then your content might change or what you put on that page might change or there might be some specific use cases that make this stand out a little bit more, um, but you by doing those, you get into these if-else statements. So take a step back, think about what is the end goal of why you're trying to go into this new content type or have a single-use content type and determine is there a real business case there or am I doing it just because it's a, the simplest solution for me and uh, I can just click a couple buttons, make a new field, and I'm done with the work, rather than what's the long-term impact of this going to be?
Um, so the question was about if you use single use content types, is there more use of it when you want to try and aggregate things up to views or things of that nature? Um, I would argue yes and no. Um, typically, as politically terrible as an answer as that is, <laughs> um, um, but what I tend to look at there is better use of taxonomy and categorization across um, individual nodes and pages versus trying to use the content type as your delineation layer. Really think about the editorial experience that the user's doing and what you're trying to achieve versus just a categorization system of what you want to aggregate things together for in views. The best thing for views in aggregating, though, is that consistent field structure. So you have a consistent name for an image, you have a consistent name, as my laptop goes off, <laughs> you have a consistent name for um, the image, the uh, summary, the title, usually a title field that's specifically for landing pages and outside of the detail page of the content type. Um, and all those are the same names, the same fields on all of them, so that way you're not having to do logic on the front end of what displays where. Yeah. Yeah, so the question's about removing the technical debt <laughs> and what do you do to evolve that over time? Um, so I thought about that actually and one of the debates we had was do we make it just a booing <laughs> or do we actually make it like a drop down or something that could be expanded so when the 2025 design comes around or the 2026 design comes around, um, my in the, we'll to be totally frank, we'll come to that when we come to that <laughs> on it. <laughs> But in general, where I see it, it's evolving over time. And if you're setting up fields correctly and different pieces, I can see that checkbox actually going away from the UI in the future. And then over time, through normal sprint cycles and as you're updating a component or doing updates to CSS, for example, or accessibility or different brandings, you take out the if statements in the code around it to help do some of the changes. And I think that's gonna get easier and easier because we should be supporting more feature flags in general versus holding things in development environments for months and months and months. If you're following this, you're not having to do that anyway, but um, feature flags are a really good thing. And whether, they're a, when it, whether it's the real world use case of a feature flag and all the complexity that you can overcomplicate with or whether it's just a simple booing and some if statements in code, um, you can start bringing yourself back of that. And it's already pretty abstracted into one spot. You're not looking at, oh, I gotta search the entire code base for all these situations. I also think the important thing about that, as from a non-technical person, is just expect, like, expect it that there's going to be technical debt. Like we um, have historically kind of, I don't know, we try to pretend like it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, and I think whether you're working with an agency partner and you have a frank discussion about how that gets incorporated in whatever you know your relationship is, or if you're an internal team, like creating dedicated sprints or just breaks in the cycle to actually be proactive about technical debt, but also understand what technical debt you're willing to absorb. Like, there's debt that you need to incur. And that was the interesting thing to kind of watch these conversations transpire, you know, about this project was, were the conversations between the developers on the team trying to figure out like, what is the, what is the debt that we're willing to incur? And what do we want, what do we not want to incur? And where we're prioritizing the authoring experience or we're prioritizing some of the changes that we made to um, like the overall grid system that you know made things a little bit complicated in the shorter term and the midterm, but overall had uh, like exponential benefits on the project that we felt like it was a worthwhile trade-off. Yeah, one of the, whenever we have someone come in like a new hire or a, a contractor or anyone come on as like an orientation session, I often give. And one of the pieces I always talk about is that when you develop something, whether you are architecting it, building it, or the user of something, when you first look at it, you think of all the things you want it to do, then you actually build it and it only does the things that it could do at the, the given the constraints. But within two days, you're gonna look back and I'm like, eh, I could do this better. I could do some different things. In two weeks, you're like basically like, what what is this like in two months you're ready to rebuild it and in two years you're like who is this idiot that like decided to do all it this way and like so it doesn't matter what you do and how far ahead you try to think technology is changing so rapidly that you're never going to eliminate it's just like ellie was mentioning a much better way of non-technical of how much you're willing to take on and focus that effort on sprints to address it and that not only is going to help your overall cycles um, with Drupal, now you've got a solid foundation in Drupal 10 or any modern CMS <laughs> if it's not Drupal. I mean, 
Um, but you're, you're having that modern foundation. You actually have to invest in it or else you're going to get into a same spot of like a Drupal 7 situation where you're just stuck. And we naturally had that in our industry and now we don't. Let's not let ourselves get back into that spot again by not continuing to iteratively upgrade along the way. Awesome. All right. Thank you all so much. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. All right. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of silly that I'm coming up here for this. We're going to take a slight break. Uh, stretch your legs. We're going to return at 3. And so when we come back, we're going to be doing BA format. So I'm going to let you know we're going to be designating certain tables for certain topics. So just make that aware when you come back.